right, thanks everyone. Hey, so our first talk is Brent Kennedy with uh, CERT and then Jason Frank with the Veris Group. Go hack yourself. 10 pen test tactics to Blue Team. Jason Frank. Uh, again, I'm with uh, Veris Group's Adaptive Threat Division. We're a small uh, DC-based security consulting company. Um, I run a team called the Adaptive Threat Division, um, a group of about 20 pen testers. So if anybody's looking to jump into pen testing, we're looking for senior to junior. Um, I also teach the Adaptive uh, Penetration Testing class at Black Hat coming up here. Um, and my specialty has been focused on uh, building and executing penetration testing programs for both the federal government as well as uh, large health care providers uh, most recently as well. Hi, hey, I'm Brett Kennedy. Can you hear me all right? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I work across the city of CERT. Uh, it's on Carnegie Mellon's campus. It's part of the Software and Software Engineering Institute. Um, I am the, one of the lead pen testers there. Uh, we partner uh, with Jason's company uh, and some government clients to do a lot of pen testing you know, for federal, state, local governments, as well as a lot of critical infrastructure. Uh, so if you happen to work in any of those domains, you know, come talk to me, talk after, we can do some really cool work for you guys um, at a very good price, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> And uh, Will Schrader, uh, he helped write a lot of this presentation. We apologize he couldn't be here. Um, follow him on uh, Twitter, it's HarmJoy. He does a lot of cool stuff. Um, he's one of the lead researchers at Veris Group. Uh, he's one of the co-authors of the VEL framework, if you're familiar with that. It's an AV bypass, uh, bypass tool. Uh, and he's the sole author of the power tools, uh, which uh, we'll be getting into a lot today. So a uh, big contributor for there. Uh, between the three of us, we have about 12, 12 years experience uh, leading pen test engagements. We go from anywhere from federal government, like I said, to you know private customers, so we kind of get to see the, the broad spectrum of everything. So, uh, why are we here? So, you know, like I said, we do all these pen tests, and we you know kind of start seeing a theme. Uh, you know, usually if there's any pen out there, you know, usually out briefing on the last day, you're talking to the customer, you're telling them what you found. And we start to see this trend where you know we would get you know sysadmins, uh, you know, knock guys, sock guys, they'd start coming up to us and they just you know start asking questions. You know, how do I get involved with this? You know, how do I, you know kind of is there any stuff on pen testing online? You know, what books can I read? What tools are you using? Um, and especially we'd start doing findings. You know, we'd say you know here's our attack path. And we got in through this this web app, and they were like, I've been here a year, and I've never seen that web app in my life. How did you find that in two days? So you know, we start thinking to ourselves, you know, well, we're using all these specialty tools. You know, why aren't the blue teamers using the same exact things? Um, it could be for a couple reasons. You know, obviously, it's two different sides of the fence. You know, they may not have the offensive training. You know, uh, the skills. Those black tie classes are expensive. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, and you know, really just thinking offensively is always a different mindset. You know, you know, even though the attacker and the offender they're playing in the same space, it's just a different way of thinking. Um, and also sometimes the hacker tools, so to speak, they kind of get the bad connotation. You know, people start thinking, oh, it's a hacker tool, it's just going to break my network, everything's going to go down. Where in actuality, as you'll see here, a lot of this stuff is really just you know mapping, information gathering, things like that. It's not you know your remote code ex execution and those things. Quick poll: How many people here uh, operate on the blue team? Okay, good. Good. It's not true. Yeah, it's not true. Um, it, it's kind of strange, you know. We'll be we'll, we'll execute one to two week engagements, and in the course of those five to ten days, we'll know more about people's network than some people uh, people on the blue side know. And so that's kind of daunting, right? You go into the outbreak and you're like, they're like, well, I don't even know those those network ranges and those web apps exist. You're like, man. So, so we're trying to give you some tools and tactics to kind of get the lay of the land and, and really kind of dive into your network a little bit more. 
So as Jason said, the blue teamers out there, um, I will seriously buy you a beer later because your job is so much harder than our job. Um, and part of that, like I said, we find stuff because you know that's our job we're there too. But you are so you know you have so many things you have to worry about. The biggest thing is you are just trying to find everything on your network. If you work for a big corporation, things like that, there could be stuff everywhere. Um, you know, especially if you work in university type settings, we do those where you have students, researchers. They have the freedom to kind of throw stuff on the network, and then it becomes your problem. Um, and you have to worry about patching it, updating it, and it's not just OS level patches, it's all, all the little software people are installing, custom apps, third party stuff. And you're just trying to be consistent. You're trying to, you know, you might have like a, a standard base image or something that everyone uses, but then you're gonna get the special request, you're gonna get the CEO and whatever saying, I want this, I want this music, I want whatever, and then you think, you know, they get to break policy. Where then you have to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and not to mention costs, you know, we're, everyone in this room probably knows this, we're always up against, you know, probably no one in here has the unlimited budget to do whatever, whatever you want with, so you kind of have to pick and choose what tools that give you the best value. Um, and finally, you know, it kind of goes into the whole political thing, you know, security is always going to be the trade-off, you always, you know, I think it's getting a little bit better, and I think that's just because CNN is saying the word hack every day, but, you know, you have to get everyone to buy off on, you know, getting a security product, because some of them isn't cheap. Um, and until something happens, people don't think it's, it's important until you get breached and something like that. So we know that's what we're trying to uh, aim here, that we can kind of maybe give you some of these tools, some of these tactics that can give you that leverage down the line to uh, you know, have some political capital, I guess. Yep. So on the flip side, you know, as an attacker, you know, we'll talk about it from a high level. You know, what's an attacker looking for? They're looking for the same thing. They're trying to find what hosts are on your network. They're trying to find what, what's, what's out there. Your domain structure, you know, are you a big AD shop? What groups are you? What are the admin groups? Is it default? Is it custom? Those sorts of things. Also, a software patching because they're going the opposite route. They want to know what patches you have so they can exploit them. You know, what version of IE are you running? What version of Java are you running? Those sort of things. And it's all to find those attack vectors, those exploitable conditions that they can, you know, find their way into your network and find their way, you know, and pivot around. Um, and certainly, you know, the attackers are there for a reason. They're after your crown jewels. They're after to make money or to embarrass you or to do something. Um, but it's not so much as just finding uh, what your crown jewels are. That may be obvious depending on what business you're in, but it's also how to get there. Um, and attackers always take that path of least resistance. You know, they might not be trying to break into your database directly to, to steal all the information. They're going to pivot around your network and steal the DA's credentials and just log in. So there's always those different paths that are sometimes, you know, hard to think about that, that attackers are doing. Um, and as you can see from, you know, kind of the list on the last slide to the list on here, attackers and offenders are kind of looking for the same information all the time. The whole inventory thing, patch cycles, those sorts of things. So that's another reason why we started doing this presentation was to, you know, if we're using the same tools to find this stuff, you know, maybe defenders can use the same ones as well. So uh, some you know, pros to hacking tools. This isn't uh, inclusive to everything that every hacker tool out there. Obviously, some are a little worse than others. Um, but for, for everything we're talking about here, you know, there just tend to be smaller scripts. You know, it's not the big COTS product installation that has to go on everything. This is just stuff you can run quickly with Python or PowerShell or things like that. Um, some even run in memory; they don't even touch the disk. Um, free is awesome. I think everything we talk about is on GitHub, uh, which is great. Uh, you know, it's that straightforward, easy to use. You just read the flags. You kind of play with it. And kind of most importantly, as I said, you know, the hacker tools kind of get that bad connotation sometimes. A lot of the stuff we're doing here, especially the PowerShell stuff, you know, it's using, you know, valid system calls. It's, it's talking to the main just as a user would or just how you interact through your computer. It may be doing it in bulk in a lot of the time, but it's, you know, valid calls. It's valid traffic, um, which is good if you maybe uh, have to get some sign off to run stuff on your network. Usually this will be a little bit easier because it's valid stuff. Uh, the bad side of it is the attackers are using it and it's valid stuff, so you know your IDS and things like that might not catch it, so it's kind of a no-witch sword there. Yeah, and, and I have conversations with, with blue teamers a lot, and they say, well, you know, we don't have the budget, we don't have the political buy-in to kind of get there. Um, and so with these are our quick wins. It's a list of quick wins that are going to allow you to kind of build some uh, momentum within your organization. You'll find information, you'll, you'll actually make changes to your security posture. Um, hopefully enough that if you have to invest money down the line, you're going to have the clout to be able to go and say, I need this for this, right? So you're going to see kind of a trend here for uh, a lot of the list. Um, we operate as pen testers uh, primarily in a Windows environment. I know a lot of you are saying, okay, well, you know, the crown jewels are on NICs boxes, they're on databases, that type of thing. Chances are, though, um, you know, the most common way into an organization at this point is spear phishing, right? You send an email, a lot of people click on emails, people click stuff all the time, they're not supposed to. 
And so what's going to happen is when people click on those emails, chances are you're going to land on a Windows box. That Windows box is probably going to be the user land space, which is connected to a domain environment, which as a pen tester or an attacker we can leverage to move around your network, get the access we need. The Linux, the DB admins, they're going to have Windows boxes that we can leverage to just log directly in to those crown jewel target boxes. So that's kind of our attack path. That's, that's what we use. And a lot of it, because we are using valid credentials, we're using valid calls and things like that, the blue teamers can tend to be blind to our activity. That's why we're trying to educate you on how we're doing it. So anybody use PowerShell in their day-to-day -day, uh, operations? Yeah. So if you haven't jumped into PowerShell yet, I only saw a few hands. Um, for Windows, this has been a huge step forward from the adminning side. And I always talk to people, I say, pen testing is just adminning with a different intent, right? Um, everybody was afraid when Windows 7, uh, Windows 2008 came out, they're like, oh, all these memory protections, all the traditional buffer overflows, they're not going to work uh, because of, you know, ASLR and depth and all that. And I'm like, well, okay. but. Then people started hooking into PowerShell and seeing the real power behind it and what you can do with it. And we've actually put together on our team a, a library of offensive tools that uh, we can use to uh, carve through a network pretty quickly. There's a note here uh, that I want to cover real quick. Uh, Microsoft intended to put a, an execution policy uh, in so that by default you can't just import your own uh, scripts and modules and things like that and extend uh, PowerShell's functionality. Well, if you just put that little flag there, it just bypasses it all. It's kind of funny. So let's take a look at our arsenal. Uh, some of the stuff you might know, NMAP's been around forever. Uh, a lot of the tools here, uh, stuff we write uh, internally, uh, a lot of my guys write. Uh, and PowerSploit, uh, with the exception of PowerSploit, that's written by a different uh, group of people. Uh, uh, Chris Campbell and Matt Graber, um, but NMAP used for you know kind of mapping out your network. Eyewitness, uh, we'll talk about it. it's a screenshotting service for your websites. Uh, PowerSploit, uh, offensive uh, PowerShell show toolkit. PowerUp is kind of neat because we use that for privilege escalation heavily. PowerView uh, we use pretty extensively, um, kind of querying uh, your network, and we'll talk about a lot of the features there. And then egress assess to kind of test your boundary. Uh, defenses and detection for data that leaves your network. So now we'll get into the actual fun stuff. Uh, so we're going to go over kind of 10 tactics um, and they kind of follow a theme. So, you know, each of them kind of has three things. They're, they're quick, quick to run. Uh, they generate a lot of data for you and uh, they're free, as we said. All of us use are on GitHub. So our goal there is kind of, you know, when you combine those three things for each of these, that it's going to give you kind of an immediate value. Um, you know, we like to say it's stuff that after this, you, know, you might be able to pull that together in a script. You might be able to run this. You know, if you have a secure system or something, you might be able to run this while drinking your coffee daily, weekly, those sorts of things, and, and see some changes there. Uh, so I'll let Jason start off here with the asset. So the biggest thing, what's in your network? Uh, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> they actually, uh, they said, we're going to use your pen test as our inventory exercise. Okay. All right, so... Um, <coughs> Kind of free and cheap, right? Use Nmap to conduct a network discovery in your network. You know, have, you know your range, hopefully. If you don't, ask. Um, and then put a cron job out there. Every 25 hours, go ahead and scan your network. Um, and what this will do is over the course of a, the month, it will detect throughout the day uh, changes within your network. There's going to be some network enclaves that you should see a lot of change. It's going to be user land, right, as people put their computer to sleep and wake it up and all that. Um, but there should be things that don't change, like your server enclaves, your database enclaves, that type of thing. If you do see deltas there, uh, you can script up alerts real quick uh, and kind of take care of them as needed. Um, what we do once we uh, find the endpoints is we do a service detection and we find out, okay, what TCP services are available. Anything that comes back that's common to web, 80, 443, 8080, those types of things, um, or what NMAP tells us is a website, we throw into a tool called Eyewitness, uh, written by Chris Trunzer, uh, one of my guys. 
Um, and what it does is it reaches out and it creates an inventory of all those websites. Um, and it's in an HTML document, local HTML document. Um, and you can just quickly see all the web applications within your network. Uh, these slides are going to be posted, so here's some syntax that you can use uh, both for um, endpoint identification as well as service identification, and then what you can do for, with Eyewitness there. Um, and here's a screenshot real quick of Eyewitness. Uh, what it does is it summarizes at the top what it's finding. It does attempt categorization between printers and network appliances and, and potentially highly vulnerable web servers. Uh, and then it also gives you a running inventory here of a screenshot as well as uh, the um, little bit of information about the request. Okay, so uh, as Jason said earlier, you know, we talked about spear phishing. Uh, it was kind of the most common attack vector today. It's, it's cheap, we all hate it, but it kind of is what it is. So you imagine if you get spear phished, you know, 100 people get spear phished, whatever. They're gonna land at 100 different places within your network. Um, you know, maybe they'll get a sysadmin or something like that. Probability-wise, says no. They're gonna, you know, it's gonna be in the HR department, it's gonna be in the admin department, whatever. First thing an attacker is gonna do is they're really gonna look at that base image and try to find out what it is, what's on there, and it goes back to you know where the patches and things like that. And they're gonna try to escalate. They're gonna try to take the, the basic user who clicked on that phishing email, whoever that may be. And they're gonna try to you know get bigger privileges. Um, and this goes also back to the kind of consistency thing. You, know, you may have a consistent, uh, you know, Windows baseline or something that, that rolls out to every single user. And this is, you know, how you want to check that. And you know, a lot of people say, you know, about every, you know, every patch Tuesday I patch it, and that's great. We need to do that. Um, but that's just taking care of the Windows stuff. You know, going back to the third-party patching, it's the custom apps. You know, things that are specific to your business. You want to develop stuff in house that maybe just be kind of running at at higher levels, things like that. Um, what's going to happen is uh, there's a uh, one of the power tools. Uh, is called power up, um, up being escalating up. And what it does is it goes through all of these baseline checks and it's really uh, looking and the invoke all checks function will check everything. Um, looking at kind of screenshot here, you can see and really what it's doing, it's gonna enumerate every single service that's running on there and it's gonna start checking things like, what is that service running as? What are the permissions to, to run the service to start and stop it? Things like that. Uh, what path is the service in? So, um, you know, this runs almost instantly on any baseline. We suggest that if you have maybe multiple baselines, you, you make sure you're running it on each. Um, but, you know, for example, the one that's highlighted here, you can see that this, this temp6 service is vulnerable, um, vulnerable service executable. What that means is the path, you know, you know, that's a service that's running at higher level privileges, and the normal user shouldn't be able to mess with that service, but they can write to that path. So what you would do is you would take, make your own temp6 malicious executable, replace that, and a lot of these admin services, things like that, they start on boot, whatever. You reboot the machine, you're familiar with the sticky, finger, sticky keys attack, that's what this is. Reboot the machine, it'll run your malicious executable at that higher level privileges and that usually gives you a shell back at a different level so that's just one example of privilege escalation but this tool just kind of goes through and checks checks all of those if you're if you're wondering uh, first of all this is not an intrusive it's just mm -hmm. checking stuff um, number two the list of checks are pretty well documented we're going to give you some resources on what exactly it checks for a lot of this is just publicly available information pen testers have been talking about these these escalation tactics for some time now we just made it pretty quick and easy for um, you know one powershell script yeah so the next tactic um, is my favorite one so I won't say show of hands, maybe, but <laughs> how many of you, you know, you're whether you're at work or you're like somewhere, you know, you fire up like Windows Explorer and like you see like the network button and you kind of click it and you kind of wait to see everything populate down and you see like Joe's computer and you're like, well, take a look at that. You know, start like through people's file hands. Yeah, I do all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> <You're on laughs> <that video>. <laughs> <laughs> attackers and pen testers do it too. Uh, because you find a lot of stuff in there, you know, especially if you're in a big corporate environment You have file shares everywhere because they're needed, you know, people are doing projects or sharing stuff different departments But things can get misconfigured um, I know one of my favorite stories is we were on an engagement and we got into this guy's computer and in his home drive He had an Excel file and uh, honestly God it was like 350 lines long and It was just column A username caller B password column C what it is and it's just like my 10 credit cards my three bank accounts my retirement my domain password, you know, just everything like three of my ESPN, like everything was on there. Uh, and you're like, why didn't people have it? Uh, you know, clear text. Yeah, password bulk. Um, but, you know, that's just personal stuff, and obviously that can be bad, but you also think about if your company's, you know, harboring any sensitive information, sensitive information, some proprietary stuff, things like that. And so um, the next tool we'll show you, it kind of looks for all these uh, file shares, 
um, in its uh, power view, which is a very powerful tool, this specific function is called invoke share, <coughs> share finder. And what it's doing is when you run it, this is a, a PowerShell script, it'll just query the domain, and the domain will be able to return, and this is a normal user, you don't have to be any elevated. A normal user, the domain will return every single file share that it knows on every single computer. Um, additionally, you can add the check share access flag, and that's going to check the, the current user you're running as. It's going to check to see what user that has access to. So we will always run that, and I'll show you with the screenshot here. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of getting a list of things. So those are the things that the user is running as, the file shares that he has access to. So this is obviously a demo environment. You know, we highlighted there's a secret folder there that's actually hidden, so we'll, we'll pull back hidden folders as well. Um, but you know, we also see a lot of things like you, know, you see admin dollar sign there in your eyes light up because that means that you can that user can absolutely remote to that system and actually gain access to the host. So this is one I like to tell um, you know blue, blue defenders because like I said, there's so many shares out there and it's so hard to keep track and a lot of people have access to different things and you know it might not even be it might just be you know a nuance where you know, we see a lot of folders where they are configured nicely. You know it's it's only this user, this user, and this user, but then someone checked everyone at the bottom. So it just negates everything that they were trying to do. And you know, we find ways like that, and this is a big way that attackers are using to pivot around the network for things like the yeah, admin dollar sign. Yeah, you're gonna notice too, this really comes down to configuration issues. If, if there's a group within a subgroup within Active Directory, and you add the mother group to you know, a share, and then you don't realize that you're adding more people than you think to the share, you know, this tends to happen. We actually went into a bank recently, and uh, we were able to see, as a normal user, so if somebody, anybody in the company clicked on the email, um, we could see all the, the personal files of every, every employee uh, because what they did was they added all users uh, to the to the uh, parent folder, and so we were, we just jumped onto the president of the bank's uh, share, and he had a, a just an Excel sheet of socials and PII and all kinds of craziness, and he's like, "Yeah, we need to." verify our accounts that are held by actual people for regulations and it was like tens of thousands of like unencrypted <laughs> and this is another one where uh, you know back to the check share access flag um, if you're a system and you have this ability you know make a user in each each different group whatever groups you have within your company and then run this to see because it might not just be looking for wide open file shares you might also want to check for to make sure that users in this group don't get to see certain things. You know, everyone in the company shouldn't be privileged to everything, depending on where you are. So, uh, it's good to know who your admins are. Um, especially if you have a complex Active Directory setup, you know, depending on the size of your organization, right? If your organization has made acquisitions, right, if they've bought companies and you just kind of merged uh, Active Directory uh, infrastructures together, kind of this Frankenstein setup, um, Sometimes it's really hard to derive who the look, the, um, the admins are, right? So it, uh, it's good to know that. Uh, and again, we talk about the concept of nested groups. PowerShell, again, a situational awareness tool, uh, allows you to get the admin groups. Um, it allows you to recurse these groups to figure out who exactly is in these groups that has access to what. Um, and here's a quick uh, uh, screenshot of that. Um, but more importantly, where are your admins operating? In your network, uh, does anybody have a policy that says, okay, if I'm an admin in the network, I need to have a regular user account unprivileged that I'm supposed to operate in? Yeah, perfect. So how many uh, admins actually adhere to that? Oh, good, good, congratulations. <laughs> you get a feeling later. Um, uh, chances are they don't, right? And so they say, well, you know, I, I'm an admin, I know what I'm doing, um, so I'm, you know, don't worry about me. But if as an attacker I get access or I get one of those guys to click on something, my job becomes a lot easier because I don't have to escalate. I already have admin proofs on your network. <coughs> Um, again, Power View, uh, what we do is we do this, we perform this technique called user hunting. <coughs> Highly documented by Will Schrader, uh, but the purpose of this is, again, Power View reaches out to your Active Directory uh, infrastructure, it queries, it says, where are all my hosts? Give me all the hosts. And then it reaches out to those hosts and it queries and says, who's logged on to this host? And then what you can do is you can say, okay, um, if this person is in this specific group, and typically we're looking for privileged groups like domain admins or server admins, 
or that or desktop admins, that type of thing. If you're in this certain group, return for me the box, the endpoint that this person's logged in currently, and the name of the user. So I know who to target. Right? As a blue team, or you want to know where these admins are, are kind of residing within your network because if you get access to one of these boxes, you can uh, use that access to move throughout the network. So you want to make sure that these things are enclaved off. So you'll see things like file servers, uh, DCs, that type of thing. You want to make sure that these are kind of protected so it's a little bit harder for the attacker to get there. So this is the equipment I'm not going to bore everyone in the room with. Password policy, you know, we're all mostly security people while we're here. Um, you know, you have to probably yell at your significant other, your mother, your grandmother, change your passwords, change them often. often. Um, but it can be hard in a big environment to make sure you, uh, users are changing their password. And, you know, sure, there's group policy, sure, you can force some things, and that's great. You know, but there's also, you know, other things out there. There may be systems that are under the radar. There may be things, you know, people that are excluded. You know, you get your, your C-level, your board of directors who don't want to have to deal with all your crap. So, uh, you know, but they still change their password. So this is just a quick, uh, quick check to uh, be able to check for, um, you know, last time passwords were changed. Uh, so nothing too crazy here is you see the git net user command, which is part of power view, but that's really just the, your standard net user commands, which enumerates everything. Um, but then it kind of gets piped through a lot of comes through there that's really checking for at this, at this one, you can see the negative 12 meaning a year, 12 months, um, checking for those accounts. So when you run it, um, what it does is it gives you kind of a nice listing of your entire domain of, of usernames that haven't had their password changed within a year. Um, like I said, you know, for the most part, this is probably going to take care of group policy, but this is a nice way to just check to make sure that nothing is flying under the radar. Plus, you see a lot of like service accounts that were pulled from this demo. That's probably true in your network because they're not probably obviously adhering to your policies you're set up, or they're not in that. Um, and you know, some of these may or may not have to be changed, but you know, service accounts can be just as juicy as regular ones on some occasions. Who would use service accounts? <laughs> no, no but, yeah. but, but I mean appliances. Services, like yes. Yeah. So, and those are things that service accounts can have going back to the service checker power up. You know, if they may be running under a specific service account, you know, for whatever specific, you know, custom software, and they might have elevated privileges. So, yeah, like endpoint management, you'll see usually as a service account. If some admin's putting in like some sort of like management hack to, you know, do something, they might create like their own service account that runs around with those stuff. Or the admin group might just share some some global admin account, which is great. Um, so talking about domain trust, there's there, I can we can give a whole talk on domain trust. Um, but again, think back to the concept of acquisitions, right? If somebody, if a company buys another company and they're hooking their Active Directory infrastructures together. A lot of times to make things work right away, what we as attackers will tend to see is they'll just global trust each other. And so what that means is that an admin in domain A can then become an admin in domain B. And so if a subsidiary is getting acquired and maybe they didn't have as much money, they didn't have um, as robust of a security posture, and the mothership is sitting there and they just hook together, then you can just ride in through the subsidiary and get out to the mothership and then get the crown rules of the mothership. And so that's that's how we tend to operate. Uh, again, Power View can do this for you. Um, it has a function called Map Domain Trust. And again, these are all just system calls to your Active Directory infrastructure. Um, and you can export a CSV. Um, what Justin Warner, another one of my guys, did is he figured out a way to visually represent these domain trusts using a uh, software, I think it's called Wyatt. Um, it is free, yeah. Um, so what will, what will tend to happen is we'll jump into like the core network, you know, spearfish in, and these are kind of shady, but, uh, jumps up to the mothership, and then we might jump it over to contracts and then just ride trust down into another company um, and then jump into the crown jewels eventually, right? It takes a lot of kind of figuring out where you are in the network, and typically this is a, a little bit of a longer term engagement, uh, but it can be done, and something like this uh, is very good to kind of present to uh, your management structure to figure out, okay, you know, what's what's talking with each other? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing is your domain controllers in Active Directory uh, tend to be highly critical boxes within your network. Um, also, you know, other high value servers. But who has local admin access on your domain controllers? 
Uh, sometimes, you know, obviously the domain admins or the enterprise admins in the domain are going to have access to the do domain controllers or the file sh servers or things like that. But what we'll see on occasion is we'll see other people, other, you know, admins, you know, we find that some admins tend to be a little bit lazier than others, and they might just add themselves to the local admin group on the domain controller. So instead of me running around your domain infrastructure, if I know that I landed via Spearfish on this specific admin, I might just try logging into the DC directly. Excuse me, directly. So it's good to know all the different ways into your domain controllers, into your high value servers, um, again, as an attacker, I'm going to take the path of least resistance. It just, uh, uh, we, you can also do this in PowerView. Uh, figure out your uh, domain controllers and you can figure out, um, uh, you can look at the local admin group here. And here's just a quick screenshot of what uh, you might see. So you might, you might be a little bit hard to tell, but uh, you'll see, you know, domain users versus local users here. So, um, you know, say you started a job, you know, you're going to a computer, you have a desktop computer, you have a laptop, you know, obviously you log in, you log into that thing, um, and all sorts of things. You know, there's things on your desktop, you might already have printers set up, they might be some file shares set up for you. All that stuff is being set up with group policy preferences. Um, and really what that's doing is you're logging in your computer, it's going to query the domain, uh, the public sysfall folder. It's going to look for these XML files. Uh, those contain all the actions needed to, you know, whatever, let's just say setting up a printer. Um, you know, it does it. Um, but some of these though can uh, need local admin. So in that XML file, there is a C password file um, containing an encrypted password. I think it's encrypted AES and then it's base 64 I think. And your computer brings that down and it has a built-in Microsoft decrypt key and it decrypts the password and it runs the administrative process in now you have a printer. Great. Anyone know what the problem with that was? Yes? Static key. Yes. Not just that, but Microsoft published that key <laughs> to like to like the internet. Well, they missed the end. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, attackers lit up with that one, and this is uh, one we're using um, Mac River's whole power exploit. Really what that's doing is doing exactly what your computer just did. It's gonna, you know, query the domain, look in that syswell folder, it's gonna pull um, all the XML files, and it's gonna look for anything that says C password, it's gonna use the key that is just built into the tool, and it's gonna start decrypting them. And here you can see where those keys live. Um, you know, and some, some passwords, some administrative passwords, because that was needed to do the function, because it's an administrative function. Um, yes, this has been patched. I think it was the 14025, MS 14025 patch list. Um, so, you know, most people are probably good with this now. But once again, you know, on Petsys, we see everything. You still see XP machines, you see 2000. So, this is just a nice, quick way to get P uh, GPP password to be able to make sure that, you know, you're, ri you're rid of this in your entire domain. I found a Windows 2000 box on a pen test one time, and um, the guy was like, oh, yeah, we usually um, unplug that whenever the auditors and the pen testers come around. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys use it for? CD burning? <laughs> Great. All right. Um, last one's a little bit of, uh, it's a biggie, um, especially with a lot of the breaches uh, that are happening. Um, we've actually gotten a lot of interest within the healthcare space most recently about this. Um, but what you can do, and this kind of requires a little bit of an infrastructure setup, you can use an Amazon free instance, um, but you can use a tool called Egress Assess, again written by one of my guys. Um, <coughs> essentially what it does is, as an attacker, once I get to the point in the network where I know that I have access to your crown jewels, whether that's you know, patient data, or if it's like financial bank data, or um, you know, anything, uh, choose your poison. Um, what I want to do is I want to test your egress capability. So I'm in your network, I want to see if you can detect sensitive data leaving your network. And, you know, I might try to be, you know, kind of quiet at the beginning, I'll wrap it in, you know, SSL and, you know, send it out. If you don't see that, then I'll say, okay, well, I'll do it in HTTP, clear text, do it in FTP. Oh, you're still not seeing it? Well, now you have a problem. Um, but what we, what we use this tool for is to generate a, a bunch of, of data, fake data, either credit cards, socials. You can generate, uh, as of last week, you can generate full identities, uh, fake identities, uh, random user, uh, first name, last name, address, um, social, that type of thing. 
And so what you do is you set up an, uh, a border box, maybe like I said, in Amazon, and you set up the server uh, piece and the type of uh, load you want to drop it into. And so in this case, it's going to be a web server. <coughs> Excuse me. And then on the client, you know, kind of like you've been doing all along with the Windows uh, PowerShell stuff, is you can import the PowerShell module for EgressSS and then specify the mode, specify where you're going to send the data to, um, and then the data type. And hopefully, what you see is, this is a screenshot, I know it's hard to see, this is a screenshot of Snorby, which is the front end for Snort. Uh, you'll see an alert pop, and you'll see the data, right? So this checks for two things, right? It says, okay, one, am I actually getting the alert that I'm supposed to? No, okay, stop, we'll, you know, tune your stuff. Uh, or, if you are getting the alert, do you have the process in place to actually act upon this? If you actively see exfil happening within your network, are you in a position to rapidly stop it and then eradicate whatever's on that box that's causing the exfil? If no, then we, we have to have a discussion. So to conclude here, um, you know, what did you learn? And don't say nothing, at least not to my face. Um, we hope if you take anything away from this is that, you know, maybe, you know, if you guys, people out there that are on the blue side of the fence, you know, you won't be as scared as hacker tools or you may start looking into the hacker community um, and start trying to pull down things that may, may make your life a lot easier. Um, you know, everything, with the tactics, I think, you know, like I said before, we're trying to make sure that they were quick, uh, they give you a lot of data, uh, and they're free. So, uh, as you saw here, a lot of these are easily repeatable. You may not want all of them or deal with them, but you may be able to take a couple of them, maybe able to script them together even more, and like I said, run it, run it in the morning while you're having your morning coffee. Um, and a lot of these, as Jason, I think, kind of mentioned before, uh, you know, we weren't really exploiting anything. This wasn't, you know, it was safe. It was just, you know, domain queries, things like that, things on the network. So and what they're really trying to do is just find those misconfigurations because nowadays, you know, the, you know, external is getting smaller, things like that. People are getting better with patching. You know, it's still out there. You still have those, you know, exploitable conditions where you need that new, new great remote code exploitation, whatever. A lot of the times the attackers are getting into spear phishing, they're moving around their network, they're trying to find that one misconfiguration that's going to give them that, those, that domain admin and then they're just going to walk into your database or, or whatever it may be. So our goal here was to hope that these hacks will help kind of you know, rid those of your network um, and help find those misconfigurations. We want to get to the point where we're not in our outbreaks and as pen testers we're asking the blue team about their network and saying, well I didn't know that existed. Right? That's the whole point. Like a lot of this stuff is such situational awareness and gaining a, a deeper understanding of what's going on within your network. Right. And finally, like a lot of the operators too, you know, we have, you know, we'll, you know, we'll see a great IT crew, but they may be like three people deep and maybe this major organization and they're just like, we just don't have time. Because like I said, your job is hard and you have to cover so much ground. So we're hoping that with this being free and repeatable, that it may give you that some of that leverage that you can maybe take up the chain. You can show your bosses this, you know, look up, you know, look at the holes we have in our network. And it's not a matter of just, oh, I can go fix them right now. It's we need resources, we need appliances to detect, you know, egress stuff, things like that. So. Yep. So, I mean, it, it, the takeaway from this is you gather information uh, to make immediate impact. Uh, you gain your political capital to do what you need to do. Profit. <laughs> All right. So, again, my name is Jason Frank. Uh, on Twitter is Jason J. Frank. Um, we have a whole bunch of stuff uh, at our blog, Veris Group uh, Adaptive Threat Division right there. Um, a lot of the write-ups and things for how to really, I mean, we quickly went over a bunch of these tactics, but for how to really jump into these tools and extend the functionality is all written up. Uh, a bunch of use cases are up there as well. And then you can actually get the tools. Most of them are on our site uh, because a lot of our guys are writing these things, uh, but then some of the third-party ones as well. Questions? You guys said that it's important to isolate your domain controllers and your important systems, but you also said a lot of these enumeration attacks run on regular active directory calls. So how do you isolate your servers but allow them to be open for their intended use? Sure. So the question was, you're saying that we need to isolate our high value servers. However, a lot of these are riding over SMB and Active Directory calls, which need to talk to the endpoints anyway. There's a couple different ways to do that. Um, things that I've seen are authentication firewalls, um, where you know, in order to actually 
Yeah, you can query the DC, but it actually, in order to log into the DC, only certain accounts are allowed to do that. The other thing that I've seen is Microsoft, uh, and we can talk off a little bit offline about this, but Microsoft has put out this concept of a red forest. Um, and essentially what this is, is a, um, it's a domain setup that employs um, some read-only uh, type setups and that type of thing. I, I can't really jump into the specifics, but there's, there's definitely ways to kind of enclave off and not allow for direct login access there. Any other questions? Yep. How is uh, configuration management like Puppet and Chef helping prevent people from needing to log on at all and have those privileges on those boxes? I, I use Puppet like a little bit, and I think um, you know we talked to some people that do. And you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, it's it's certainly good if you can get if it's configured well, and if you have full control over things because. You're right. If you can use Puppet and you can, you know, everything's going through that, you know for a fact that every machine's going to be configured the way you want to configure it. Um, yeah, but I think a lot of people, they struggle with getting to the point where either they have full control over that they can make those decisions or, you know, those sorts of things where, you know, other people just still need this, they still need that. They can get everyone in the organization to buy in the Puppet or those sorts of things. So, um, but though it is, can be a bottleneck. Obviously, if you have something wrong with your public configuration, then you're in trouble because then it's going to light up the whole sky. Yeah, and what we'll see too is, you know, we'll make recommendations and we'll say, okay, well, there are things that you can do, um, but what ends up happening for a lot of the environments that we're going into is they're not they're not ideally set up, right? You know, the, yes, Emmet exists. Yes, there are other controls out there that you can put on. However, people aren't doing it, and usually it's a function of time, budget, that type of thing. But um, yeah, I mean, Puppet is definitely a good step forward. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks for the time, everybody. Thank you.